I welcome back our regular viewers uh, to this series where we have been talking about talent management insights across different industries, different themes. We have uh, over the series invited industry veterans to share their insights. Uh, our guest on this uh, episode is yet another uh, industry veteran. He has over 36 years of corporate experience in areas such as sales and operations, leadership and organizational change and transformation, and he's worked across a wide variety of uh, industries. Uh, he's been focused on IT and the manufacturing domain, uh, as well as he has consulted across industries like IT, finance, banking and insurance, manufacturing, government, hospitality. Uh, he's a global Indian. He has lived and worked in Singapore, US and Canada, in addition to having traveled across 25 different countries. So without uh, uh, much ado, I would like to welcome Anand Pillay, the Managing Director of Leadership Matters to this session of Leadership Insights. Welcome Anand, welcome back to the this fresh episode of Talent Leadership Insights. Thank you, Vikram. Thank you. It's it's such a pleasure to be back in yes. this series. In our last episode on CXO uh, roles and transitioning to CXO roles, we had touched upon an aspect of longevity. So I would really like to use this episode to delve deeper into the topic of longevity. Uh, and my first question to you, Anand, is would longevity be one of the key defining factors which go into you being considered for a CXO role or there are other parameters beyond longevity? See, longevity definitely is a key parameter. Uh, you know, because uh, we need to understand the person uh, by way, way of his or her long service has understood the culture of the company, has understood the ways of working of the company, uh, has built a set of stakeholder relationships. And therefore, uh, this definitely is a key parameter. There's no doubt about that. Having said that, you know, it is also important that the person, uh, if the person is just long service in the organization without having that diversity of exposure, then it can become a limitation. For example, if the person is only in one role, 10 years, 15 years, you know, without having that two by two by two, without having different products and services, without having different functional exposure, without having different geographic exposure, that longevity actually can become a liability. So if a person says he or she has got 15 years of experience, it could well be, you know, 1.5 years of experience multiplied by 10. So longevity by itself does not render uh, a particular advantage, but longevity with that diversity in that two by two by two is what brings the eligibility component for a person to move into the CXO role. So longevity by itself is not a virtue, it is essentially how you spend those years the diversity and what the experiences and exposure we've gained across that multitude of years. So in fact I have a very interesting uh, analogy and uh -huh. that is long service is not necessarily equal to loyalty. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. So the fact that the person is there in the company for 15 years doesn't mean that he is loyal to the company. Chances are he was looking out and did not yeah. get anything. So long service is not equal to uh, uh, loyalty. That is the first thing. The second one is sincerity is not equal to competence. You know, uh, so just because the person is sincere and faithful, it does not mean that he or she is competent enough uh, for that particular uh, job. And the third one is kind of linked to the first one. Uh, long service is necessarily not equal to uh, maturity or competence. You know, the fact that the person is there in a particular role for 15 years doesn't mean he or she is a master. Uh, there. So long service is not equal to loyalty, long service is not equal to competence, and not long service is also uh, not equal to uh, commitment in the organization. I used to have a colleague. I just that. Yeah, I used to have a colleague who used to joke that it's not just the white hairs on your head, it's what you need to get them there. <laughs> so, Correct. Absolutely. <laughs> These are not natural equations which you can draw, but uh, it really depends a lot on what you did and how you got to where you are. Yes, I think that's it. So, uh, a natural question from this, uh, I mean, uh, 
uh, other ways. You see a lot of mobility now. People are moving around uh, across industries, across functions. Uh, and one does see a trend of leaders from larger companies going to smaller companies. And many times this is uh, accompanied by either a fancy salary or a fancy designation. So what do you feel about people moving around in this? I, I, I mean, you have the large corporates, the large multinationals, which seem to have their uh, pipeline of leaders and the things really don't move fast. So people, we see people moving around in the smaller companies. Uh, what is your opinion on that? Yeah, see, uh... There is definitely, uh, I won't say merit, there is definitely a case for people to move uh, around in companies for three reasons. One is, see, what happens is in the beginning, not many people are clear on what is known as an SOP, statement of purpose. What is a career objective? You know, I mean, 90% of the time, people take the first available job that is there in the campus. Now, whether they are suited for that, whether they are cut out for that, whether they are really wanting to spend the rest of their life in that particular industry or that particular geography, it may be difficult, you know. So what they do is they take the first available job, then they try around, you know. So we need to give that option and uh, uh, kind of a, um, a opportunity for people to check if that is the right one. Many companies, what they do is they don't recruit people, particularly the entry-level people, into a specific role. They move, uh, recruit them into, let us say, a management trainee. So that management trainee will be put into finance, into operations and all. So they definitely will rotate them around uh, because of this thing that you may not necessarily be cut out for a particular uh, activity. So without you leaving the company, you can still experiment that. Mm -hmm. So that there is merit in you kind of looking at other avenues. The second uh, reason why uh, people do shift and uh, uh, possibly there is a little bit merit in that is, see, sometimes what happens is the organization in a particular team becomes very, uh, what I would uh, call talent heavy. So in a particular team of, let us say, five people or seven people or 10 yeah. people, you know, yeah. almost yeah. everybody is eligible to become the department head. Almost yeah. everybody is eligible to become the function head. Yeah. Now, the company does not have um, enough open positions. Mm -hmm. Now, rather than stifling the people, mm -hmm. then person looks out uh, for a senior role or a senior designation with that uh, three parameters, size, scale, and complexity. So the person is looking for a bigger size of a problem or a scale of a problem or a complexity of a problem. They cannot grow within the organization because it's a very heavy talent, heavy organization. This is also true in academic institutions. For example, many years, the professor will be a professor only. He'll never become yeah. the head of the department. There can yeah. only be one head. Yeah. You know, so what they do is they go to a smaller institution and become the head of it. Yeah. Same thing, head of HR whatever, you know, you go, that possibility is there, but that can be addressed by way of meaningful rotation, uh, where you can actually rotate the person into a senior role into another function. Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily have to leave the company. Mm -hmm. The third uh, reason why people can uh, do shift and there is some kind of a merit is, uh, you know, sometimes what happens is you are not... Uh, what I would call a quantum growing. You're only incrementally growing within a particular uh, company, largely because of the pace of growth of the company, the CAGR of the company or whatever, but you are a fast track person. You mm -hmm. are whatever, you know, a high growth uh, person. You want to grow faster. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, there is merit in you looking at another company whose CAGR is uh, more or whose product introductions are more or whose uh, innovations are more. Uh, so we need to look at two natures of business. One is a CTB and the other is RTB. Uh, mm -hmm. Let us say CTB, change the business. If you are a CTB oriented kind of a person, you will not be comfortable in a RTB or a run the business kind of a company in a legacy company where longevity is really uh, rewarded. Because you're constantly looking for introducing new and innovative uh, ways of doing uh, things. And if your company does not 
render that kind of an atmosphere, there is merit in uh, possibly uh, looking out. But those are the exceptions. And in many companies, uh, even though there may be no formal structure uh, or incentive for innovation, uh, you definitely can do things differently in a different geography or in a different function or in a different product or service. You don't have to leave the company, is my take on it. So, um, uh, having, let's say, gone into a smaller company and then one tends to also, once you're in that circuit of, let's say, startups or smaller companies, then you tend to move around and at some point, uh, we've seen people want to come back to the mothership, come back for a second innings, come back to where you started your career. So how do those transitions work out? When you've been in smaller companies at uh, fancier designations, fancier salaries, and now you try to come back to uh, where you probably joined as a GP or a management trainee many years back, and you try to come back and try and retain that designation or salary which you've got in a smaller company, how does that work out for you? That uh, off late is getting rationalized or normalized. Yeah. Off late. Uh, uh -huh. Earlier, what was happening is, let us say, for example, you were only manager and you became a senior manager or a team leader or a group manager or a general manager in another company. And then you, because of a vacancy, you then come back, you upset the apple cart because there were other people who stayed on in that role and uh -huh. they did not get that uh, designation. So uh -huh. there are three things that are being done in the industry today to correct this uh, aberration. Uh -huh. First thing is when they do take the person, I know of many organizations, they have actually a written rule that this person will come back at the same person that he or she left if it was within three years, or this person will come back to the position that he or she could have gone into had they been in the company, irrespective of what was the role and what was the uh, kind of CTC that they were getting. So they've got an internal pegging uh -huh. to make sure that you come back to the same structure. Obviously, this is uh, in the span of about 10 years, you know. But if it is beyond 10 years, your growth could have been completely complete. But within 10 years, uh, uh, 5 to 10 years, when you come back, you will come back to the same level uh, th that you would have been uh, or the level that you would have grown had you been in the company. That is the first guideline that they have when uh, you bring back a person. The second guideline that they have is what is known as normal uh, normalcy or normalization. Normalization is, say, for example, in one particular company, take, for example, banks. I mean, I always joke about this, you know, you throw a stone on a in any bank, it will fall on a vice president. Because just about everybody is a vice president uh, uh, there, you know. I mean, uh, Accenture, for example, if you throw a stone on uh, uh, there, it will fall on a managing director. I was shocked that there are like eight, ten man managing directors. You know? So what happened? And that is largely to cater to the designation Tracy uh, people. So what they do is, uh, when they do come back and they have enjoyed a particular senior uh, designation, they normalize that designation within the uh, company. What mm. will that designation be equivalent to in terms of size, scale, and complexity? So they sometimes, uh, you know, give an external designation and an internal designation. But in most cases, they say, listen, this is what is the designation that you will come at. And therefore, you will be normalized in terms of the um, designation that you can get into. So first one is, what is the position that you can be in had you stayed in the company and what is the position you can be grown? The second one is, okay, you've got a fancy designation or whatever. Let us normalize it according to what <laughs> we would be having in our structure. That is the <laughs> second thing. The third thing that happens whenever you bring a person uh, back into uh, the company, the independent question is asked, what is the significant value that this person is bringing by way of having gone outside and coming? Has he brought in different perspective? Has he brought in different dimension, different exposure, which we would have never had if we had been in the company? So the, we are actually buying uh, external expertise and there is merit in rewarding that person disproportionately if the person is adding quantum uh, difference in perspective and exposure. 
under these circumstances, there can be an aberration, but normally uh, they go through the guideline and not do impulsive rehiring as was happening in the great resignation drama, uh, where a lot of people started coming back. Uh, as long as you have these three uh, frameworks, uh, you will not upset the Apple car. Hmm. So, so in some sense, what we are uh, arriving at is that if one does leave bigger companies in favor of smaller companies, it would uh, either you continue to be in that ecosystem of smaller companies and grow within there, or if you come back, then one needs to be pragmatic and realistic in terms of the value which one is bringing back. One cannot jump the queue in that sense. Uh, and, uh, do it, right? Yeah, I think yeah, that's a good uh, analogy which you bring out. So then, uh, because one sees that the people in smaller companies are often getting rewarded disproportionately, and that leads to many people trying to leave established companies and going to be smaller companies. So should uh, any of these bigger or smaller companies be doing anything differently to a, either hold on to their uh, uh, stable talent which is there or should the smaller company be doing anything differently to retain these senior professionals who come in uh, looking for growth but then at some point they get dissolution and then they want to go back to the safety and security of the larger company. So should either of these two companies be doing anything differently or it's, it's there is definitely. a balance in what's happening? No, no, they definitely do. See, if you look at it, every company has got what they have. Uh, they may not openly publish it. They will call them must retain talent. Uh, mm -hmm. So you have a particular talent, a particular person, a particular position is a must retain talent. And the term that actually internally is used is they use a concept called ring fencing. Uh, or golden handcuffs. So what they do is they give enough incentive by way of uh, deferred stock option, deferred uh, growth plans and so on, where the person really does not want to leave. The person is ring-fenced enough. Uh, you know, uh, this must retain talent. They ensure that very rarely is there attrition in the uh, ring-fenced people. You need to take a call. Okay, who are the people who I am willing or affording to lose. If the person is critical enough, I must ring fence the person. And that ring fencing need not necessarily be finance linked. It uh, could be an international exposure. Yeah. It could be a different function exposure. Because say, for example, you know, if I stay in one company, I may get some salary, I may get some designation. But if I stay in one company, I may not get exposure in another geography. I may not get exposure in another particular function mm -hmm. because the company is using me for my current expertise. Yeah, yeah. And therefore, I get attracted to go for another geography. And if that same geography option is given internally, mm -hmm. then I will not think of. So mm -hmm. you ring fence people not necessarily by giving attractive finance options, but look at what his or her career aspirations are. Mm -hmm. There are some people who say, listen, I'm fed up with my current role. Mm -hmm. I am leaving because I want to have more challenge. Okay, fine. Then the challenge is provided in the same company. Uh -huh. Or I'm fed up being an individual contributor. I want to become a team leader. Okay, fine. You can become a team leader. Because of this, and again, when you, when you look at people leaving, you need to step back and analyze a very common term that is known as push factor or pull factor. So look at what are the factors that are enabling this person wanting to leave. Is it a push factor? That is, is it something within the organization's control? Is our culture not good enough? Is our reward and recognition not good enough? Is our growth and uh, acceleration not good enough? Is it in our control? Look at that. Now, obviously, there'll be a pull factor. For example, there'll be a suddenly a overseas posting or a, a, a fancy designation or a fancy salary, which you may or may not be able to do. That's an external pull factor. Senior people largely move because of push factors. Okay. Junior people mm -hmm. largely move because of pull factors. Yeah. And organizations yeah. have checks and balances to arrest this and to retain their must-retain 
Yeah. So from uh, the, the same is applied applicable whether it's a small company or a large company. Uh, this would be the Smaller companies may not have structured processes. Uh, mm -hmm. See, they go by what we would call the need of the art. They'll say, yes, as a result of me recruiting this person in this senior position, I am going to upset the apple cart. Mm -hmm. But the company is small enough where they have other ways of rewarding the uh, people and therefore they don't bother too much about the criticality of the talent is so high uh, that they say, listen, we will get the talent at any cost. But many of them, they learn the lesson the hard way because they get one person and as a result of that upset five people. Uh, in large organizations, this is not so much the case. It's more so in smaller organizations. But whenever they do hire the person, they make sure that this person has got a bigger um, responsibility in contributing rather than just coming for the sake of coming and filling a, uh, an immediate talent need. So, uh, it's really great that we could go into the various nuances of longevity and uh, the, how this plays out in terms of our aspirations for uh, moving into senior roles. And uh, it's great. I'm sure a lot of people would be heartened to understand that it's not just how many years you spend in an organization, but the quality of that uh, time you've spent in that organization or across the industry. Uh, and a lot of people who move back and forth, I think you've also brought out the various pros and cons in terms of staying in an organization versus moving. And then having moved, does one come back or not? I think these are all very uh, interesting aspects which uh, professionals should consider before planning out their move uh, and also from a company perspective uh, I think you brought out how uh, organizations could uh, put in place various mechanisms to uh, for want of a better word prevent senior managers from leaving uh, how, how does one combat the various push factors and the pull factors and uh, also very interesting that very simple insight that at junior levels it's pull and at senior levels it's push. I think that 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 is a very it's, it's very simple to say, but I think that's very really how does one, yeah how does one prevent the senior people from what are those factors which lead to people getting disengaged? How does one prevent all of that? So I think these are again very valuable insights to uh, me and to all our listeners out there. So thank you, Anand, and uh, hope to meet again on yet another, another episode of Talent Management. Thank you. My closing line would be, as life goes on, you know, it is inevitable that you will add years to your experience. Correct. But the key focus should be, while you are adding years to your experience, make sure that you add experience to your years so that that becomes richer. Thank you. Golden words, Anand. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.